This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to Hide.me slash Epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization in the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are joined by Winston and Jeremy, who work at the uh, Department of Economics at the University of West Indies. Uh, Winston is the head of department and Jeremy is a lecturer there. Uh, recently they came out with a very interesting paper which uh, went, went through the arguments, reasons and models uh, supporting and arguing against the idea that whether the Central Bank of Barbados should hold Bitcoin in its portfolio of international reserves. We found that this was a very interesting topic because uh, central banks holding cryptocurrencies is, could, be, could be a very big idea and this is one of the first papers that uh, attacks this idea systematically. So we'd like to discuss uh, their work and but before that perhaps we should have an introduction from the two of them. Winston, can we have your introduction? Sure. Um, Winston Moore, as you said earlier, from the University of West Indies Cayville campus. I've been a lecturer here for the last um, nine years now, teaching primarily courses in the area of industrial development and private sector development issues. My main research interests are in the area of applied econometrics, um, looking primarily at issues, again, related to private sector development, uh, finance and environmental and resource issues. Great. And Jeremy, your introduction? Hi. Yes, I'm Jeremy Stephen, also from the Department of Economics at the University of the West Indies. And I'm a lecturer in banking and finance. My interests, my research interests primarily revolve around technology software development, ironically, and how they interact and interface with financial markets and also economic markets as well, <laughs> economies as well. Uh, I'm going to... and as a matter of interest in the near future, look at how the Internet of Things can impact on economic environments, particularly in small, vulnerable economies. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, before we start the podcast, uh, perhaps uh, perhaps it's nice if you just describe us the like the monetary landscape of the West Indies and the Caribbean, like what islands are there, what kinds of currencies they use. This is mainly for listeners and like interviewers like me who have actually never been there so we'd just like to know the landscape lord winston you go right on at first <laughs> <laughs> okay the caribbean is essentially made up of small small island developing states and the most of these small island developing states because of the vulnerability that they face so they face vulnerabilities coming from natural disasters hurricanes um, storms earthquakes and so on um, as well as from external shocks, so for example, international oil prices. So because of those vulnerabilities, a lot of these small island states in the Caribbean tend to either have a fixed exchange rate or some type of control over the exchange rate regime. And the reason for that is in a very small market, they're really you, you cannot end up in a situation where there is very little trading in terms of your exchange um, rate in that particular market. So there could be a lack of foreign exchange. So historically, most Caribbean countries have sort of gravitated towards fixed exchange rate regimes. Um, there's also a sort of overarching issue in relation to um, fiscal issues and debt finance as well, because when you're faced with those um, external challenges, it tends to lead to the accumulation of a lot of debt. And therefore, the, there's, an, there's a significant um, relationship between debt accumulation and the monetary developments in the Caribbean as well. Jeremy, you want to? Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, yeah, so just to look at the differences, again, each country tends to either have its own domestic currency or even more particularly they would be trading with the US dollar. So currencies that you figure are global currencies such as the yen, the pound, euro, even to a slightly less extent rubles, even Brazilian real which you would expect should be dominating South America. They are almost non-existent in this part of the world so if it isn't the Trinidadian dollar for instance in Trinidad 
or if you don't have the Guyanese dollar, and yes, we consider Guyana to be part of the Caribbean because of the cultural linkage. Um, Haiti would also have its Haitian franc, but outside of those domestic currencies, you've, the next popular currency would be the US dollar simply because the US A tends to be a major trading partner for the majority of our islands. We're not too far away from them. And the relationships between our markets here and South America are only now beginning. For the exception of um but for the exception of the Dominican Republic and Cuba, they might have probably some Colombian pesos or, or trade they trade it more actively with Venezuela, more actively with Peru, more actively with Ecuador. So therefore they would hold a basket of currencies that typically would not be found in English speaking. And I would even go further to say the French speaking islands which would hold Euro more so than US dollars because of their um, strict trading relationship with the French with well France. So, so when, when you talk about holding money in this context, are you talking about the central bank holding money or commercial banks holding money or who exactly are you talking about? Yeah, that distinction has to be made clear. You, you look at it throughout the entire private and public sector. So monetarily, the, your central banks, depending on your trading partners, your central bank would hold a basket of currencies that would reflect a certain demand for a particular currency. So with the case of Barbados, where although our major trading partner in a sense is England because of tourism and Canada to a lesser extent because of tourism, we import, we are a very import dependent country. So therefore we tend to hold more US dollars than anything else. And, and for example, our commercial banking sector on the private sector side, that tends to finance more so the import side of the economy. So therefore, they would hold even probably, it will be skewed even more towards US dollars than any of the currency that would have made up the basket of currencies that Winston and I looked at. And in Trinidad and Tobago, it's going to be slightly different. In the British Virgin Islands, which aren't independent, they would tend to hold, although US dollars might be traded there uh, significantly, they would tend to probably hold as a greater portion of their uh, basket of currencies within their own well, they don't really have their own currency union per se, but within their own commercial banks, they would hold significantly more pounds as opposed to how Barbados would treat it, if you see where I'm coming from. So each island has a very particular macroeconomic case and a monetary case that um, for our, all of our uniqueness. But we've got as well a small currency union within these all of these islands. Uh, called the OECS, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. And they have their own central bank, and it comprises of just around 10 uh, sovereign different areas, basically. Um, evolving, St. Vincent, Grenada, some countries you've heard of before, Grenada, St. Lucia, uh, Dominica, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Kitts, Anguilla, which is, uh, well, observant, and also a colony of the United Kingdom as well. They have their own monetary policy that tends to affect each island similarly. But at the domestic level, each of their ministries of finance will try to fulfill their own objectives based on what the govern not the governing, what, what the overarching Eastern Caribbean Central Bank wants to achieve. So it's a very complex situation. And more I talk about it, it's funny enough, I realize how complex it is. And we are actually doing a project looking at how to standardize this complexity in terms of economic indicators. But it is a complex area, and one that we figure in the near future should try to find some harmony financially to allow us not only to avoid the vulnerability that, this, that really characterizes our island states, but more so um, to allow us to be competitive globally in the financial markets. And one thing that, uh, that I'll add to that as well is that a lot of transactions in the Caribbean are actually settled in U.S. dollars. So even, say for example, if Barbados is purchasing a product from St. Lucia, uh, we don't trade, there's no Caribbean dollar to settle transactions. So therefore, transactions between Caribbean states is usually settled in U.S. dollars. So therefore, that is why the U.S. dollar is also so important in relation to um, the reserves of most Caribbean central banks. So how does holding... So why do central banks hold uh, foreign currency reserves? And how does that differ in, in the reason that, you know, like uh, your 
countries there, you know, small countries that do a lot of trade in U.S. dollars, do they hold uh, foreign reserves for different reasons uh, than, uh, for example, a country like United States? Sure. Uh, so there's first the we're holding foreign exchange reserves because we have an exchange rate peg. So the Central Bank of Barbados is, is written into the Central Bank of Barbados that the Central Bank would stands ready to exchange two Barbados dollars for one U.S. dollar. So if you go to the central bank with your uh, with your U.S. dollar and you want to convert that to Barbados dollars, you'll get two Barbados dollars. If you go there and you want to purchase one U.S. dollar, you have to hand over uh, two Barbados dollars, and that is uh, central to what the central bank is doing. Now, I spoke earlier about the issue of vulnerability. Um, Caribbean countries are very vulnerable to external shocks. So say, for example, there is an increase in oil prices. Um, if that occurs, the central bank needs to have enough uh, foreign exchange reserves within its um, holdings in order to make sure that we can still continue purchasing the oil that is necessary for our local production. So reserves, therefore, serve as sort of like a, a stock that you can draw on when things don't go your way, when there's an increase in oil prices, when there's a hurricane that affects the island, it's, it's sort of like your savings that you have um, as an individual. Then the central bank also holds those reserves as a means of um, smoothing out fluctuations. So as a small open economy, a lot of our transactions are, are based on purchasing imports from outside of the country, which then go into domestic production. Uh, in order to purchase those uh, those imports, we need to have foreign currency to purchase imports from the U.S., Canada, even other Caribbean countries. Uh, and we don't want a situation occurring where a company in Barbados wants to purchase a good and there is not enough um, foreign currency to make or to complete that transaction. So. To prevent those sort of issues occurring, we need to hold uh, international reserves of various currencies to complete those transactions. Now, if we contrast that with a country such as the United States, the United States dollar is an international reserve currency so that individuals outside of the United States still stand ready to accept the US dollar for the settlement of transactions. There is no way that someone outside of Barbados would accept the Barbados dollar to settle an international transaction. So we don't have that benefit. So therefore, we have to hold international reserve to settle our transactions. And a very fundamental bit of our economic policy, and Vincent it very much explained it, but I really need it to be said in this way. A central bank, all central banks, federal reserves, whatever you call them, they have one mandate, one chief mandate, and it's to be a lender of last resort. So even in the United States of America, if there were some speculative attack, God forbid, on U.S. dollars, then Janet Yellen has the responsibility to either influence interest rates in the market in a way where it increases the demand for U.S. dollars. And that has been the case that has led to their own recovery. So they also protect themselves um, really using monetary policy to protect at least the value of their currency, monetary policy. So what we do at the level of small islands is really not just to replicate their reasons because, again, there's a huge demand for their currencies, the euros, the pounds, even the South African um, currencies, even Brazil's uh, real, pesos. There's way more demand for those. We are not, as Winston said just now, enough of a global player in exports because we hardly export anything but just services, really. Um, we are not enough of a global player to say, well, then there's no reason to hold U.S. dollars because we can always earn U.S. dollars easily. And if need be, then we could have a, a floating currency like what most countries have because we can then allow our currency to lose value so we can earn more U.S. dollars. You see? So it's a very 
interesting dynamic. Some islands in the Caribbean, because we spoke to Barbados, adopt a floating regime. Again, I said islands, but countries like Guyana that we consider to be part of our region, they're floating. They are probably the purest example of a floating currency uh, regime, just like what you get in Europe states. And the reason they can do so is because they are competitive when it comes to commodities. They export heavy amounts of gold, heavy amounts of sugar, although that's flagging, and they do well in coconut, coconut oil in terms of value added. So they could afford to float, but Barbados can't. Trinidad did a dirty float because they were a dirty float, meaning it was still managed somewhat by their monetary authority. And the reason for that was simply because they were competitive in oil. They're a major natural gas and oil producer globally, not one of the largest, but enough to at least be a significant player. Let's take a short break to talk about Hide.me. Look, when you're choosing a VPN provider, you want to make sure that your privacy is protected. You know, if a government agency tries to force the VPN provider to hand over some of your traffic or, ban or, or browsing information, will they be able to do that? And is your payment information attached to the account? These are all things that you want to consider when choosing a VPN provider. With Hide.me, all that's taken care of. For starters, they're based in Malaysia, and Malaysian laws don't require them to keep any logs. In fact, Hide.me has no logs of your traffic or browsing uh, history. So even if a government agency was trying to force them to hand over some information, they would be straight out of luck because Hide.me has nothing to give them. In addition to that, they use a third party, party payment provider, uh, which uh, doesn't give them any of your payment information. So they have, they have no way to link an account to like a credit card or a PayPal account. So even if your payment with PayPal or credit card, there's no way for Hide.me to know which account paid for what. And of course, if you're paying with Bitcoin, then you're completely transparent. Uh, so what we suggest is if you're creating an account with Hide.me, if you want that extra level of privacy, just make a fake Gmail address and use that to sign in. So that way you're completely anonymous. You can give Hide.me a try with their free plan. Their free plan includes two gigabytes of data at unthrottled bandwidth. You can use any of their free exit nodes, which are in Amsterdam, in Singapore, and in Montreal. And you can sign up for that at hi.me slash epicenter. Now, if you use our URL, and if you decide to go premium down the line, it's gonna get you 35% off. And the premium plan gives you a lot. It gives you unlimited data. You can use as much as you want. You can connect up to five devices, so your whole household fits on the plan and you can use any of their exit nodes all over the world and they've got like 30 of them. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. So give it a try. We would like to thank Hi.me for their support of Epson and Bitcoin. Let's zoom in into, into Barbados because your, uh, your paper uh, deals with Barbados. Um, can you give us an idea of the like order of magnitude of uh, reserves the central bank holds? Like, you know, is it like, how much is it? roughly and what what happens uh, if in a crisis uh, these reserves are depleted what happens then okay so i will answer your last question first <laughs> so okay. remember the central bank has to stand ready to exchange one us dollar for two us dollars so if there are no reserves the central bank cannot fulfill that mandate and therefore the peg will um Will basically disappear. There's no way that we can maintain the exchange rate peg of two Barbados dollars to one US dollar because the central bank cannot defend that peg. There's nothing to maintain it. So the, you would then revert back to a, a freely floating exchange rate regime that Jeremy would have mentioned earlier. So the central bank in Barbados, in order to avoid that occurring, has a uh, a sort of rule that they tend to follow and it is based on the amount of imports that um, come into the country on a weekly basis. So we try to target at least 12 weeks of imports so that just in case we don't receive any additional inflows of foreign exchange in a particular period, um, if suppose there is zero in, um, flows of foreign exchange for a 12 week period, we will still have enough foreign exchange to purchase all of our imports over that 12 week period. That's all it's suggesting. Uh, at the moment, our reserve cover is around 17 weeks, uh, which provides us uh, a little bit of a buffer over the minimum reserve cover of 12 weeks. Now, you can ask the question of whether or not the 12 weeks is sufficient. 
And as a country, we tend to um, or we try to maintain the foreign exchange reserves a bit higher than the 12 weeks because we understand the fundamental vulnerability of small states. So uh, a year or two ago, I, I did a paper looking at this issue of um, the optimal reserve cover for small states as well. And it suggests that that 12 weeks is actually a little bit too low for small countries because small countries face so many external shocks from oil prices to natural disasters. So yes, 12 weeks is a benchmark that we use, but we sort of use that as a minimum floor. And we try to hold a reserves up over and above that level to ensure that we never get to that scenario where you cannot defend your exchange rate peg. So 12 weeks, what does that correspond to or 17 weeks in terms of GDP? How many percent is that? We, there's not a statistic that we normally um, yeah. calculate, but yeah. the, I guess you can do a rough mental calculation. Barbados's GDP is around eight billion dollars. Eight right billion now, billion dollars. Four point eight four, billion four, billion four, yeah, dollars. Four, four, four yeah. billion US there books. Exactly. And the reserves are just over a billion dollars. So like one eighth of that is is go is held in international reserves. So as a percentage of GDP then it would be you said a billion, so one eighth, just around two hundred million Barbados dollars out of eight billion. So just less than 10%, say less than five, say about 2.5, 3.5% of GDP, thereabouts, just roughly. The reason why we really don't look at it in terms of GDP is because um, you're generating reserves using uh, from your economic activity, but you're also consuming um, reserves um, as you import more goods and services. So the, the usual benchmark is to put your international reserves as a ratio to imports of business services. Because remember, the major mandate, again, is to be a lender of last resort. So you want to know if the economy had to stop working all of a sudden. So to point to the same example Winston made with respect to natural disasters, how long could we afford to import things when well, when the economy just stops, basically. So that's why the weeks of imports are probably even more important to us than that ratio that's being suggested. Yeah, perhaps like we could think of it like this, like uh, if you imagine a small island that depends exclusively on tourism, and Barbados is not probably like that, but if it depends exclusively on tourism, and suddenly a natural disaster strikes and tourists stop coming, and they stop coming for like three months, now, so there's no way like money from outside is coming into the economy. So the central bank is like just, just this giant battery that has some kind of energy and uh, it can still kind of drain that battery and import things that the citizens need. There, that may be oil, it might be some kind of uh, construction material or whatever. And so 12 weeks might mean that in that situation, um, the imports can go on for 12 weeks. And after that, should should uh, should uh, a situation occur where the sen the reserves are completely drained, then uh, the the island cannot import anything anymore, basically, and the prices of everything shoots up on the on the market inside the country. Well, probably more so. To, it's more correct to say a minimum of twelve weeks because remember, our commercial banking sector would also hold U.S. dollars. The reserves are an account at the central bank itself, so it just means if called upon the central bank can afford to supply or finance 12 weeks of imports. Well, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, cryptocurrencies and, and Bitcoin and how that comes in here. So yeah, yeah just from a, from a, I guess, a very taking a step back, how do you guys as, as people involved in central banking think about something like Bitcoin? Well, I am very pro Bitcoin. Thankfully, I left central banking a, a long while ago, Winston, just before me, but he was in it for a little bit longer and possibly tainted. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm very pro cryptocurrency, not necessarily Bitcoin, because now you've got the, the beautiful invention of Ethereum, and I'm quite sure someone else in the near future will solve a problem. I'm very pro cryptocurrency because it really helps the issue, it helps a small country with the issue of velocity. 
Why, what I mean is, the in small Caribbean countries, we have a very bad culture when it comes to e-commerce. It's, most commercial banks are very, very anti-e-commerce. They see it as being costly. There's not enough of a population per country. I mean, if you there's only two English-speaking Caribbean countries that have more than one million people, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. So they, they are very anti-e-commerce solutions for domestic markets. And the issue has been that most people would have found a need to go into PayPal and have their, their um, finances stored overseas. Then you've got the issues of tax avoidance and tax, not tax avoidance, sorry, tax evasion. And other non-economic issues that come up, and that will feed into economic issues. The whole prevalence of a cryptocurrency reduces the cost of transactions and it allows businesses to set up very cheaply in Barbados as the example would be of Bit and provide to the Barbadian business person, small business person or even larger companies an access to their own customers domestically. It also helps with the whole phasing out of cash, which is expensive for a central bank to produce coins, for instance, are very expensive. And our central bank over the last two years has phased out at least our lowest denomination, the one cent. So it's becoming more costly for central banks to produce money, even actual physical cash, uh, paper cash. And our central bank hasn't been that profitable for five years or so. So they're finding ways and means to ensure that they stay viable. And I'm saying that, at least from my point of view, without even referring to our work, our paper, uh, the whole idea of a central bank embracing digital currencies, cryptocurrencies for security purposes even more so, smart contracts, it, it, it helps. I even think our government, for instance, should look at really using smart contracts to verify things like land purchases, as you would see in Honduras, or to verify contracts. You know, it would help in terms of the whole issue, lessening tax evasion, which is a prime issue in Barbados. And in fact, I wish to study it a bit more in the um, near future with respect to the entire Caribbean. Winston, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, my thoughts in relation to, to Bitcoin, and one of the things that we mentioned in the paper was the whole idea of diversification. So we spoke a lot about um, the central bank holding international reserves earlier. And the central bank holds those reserves in various currencies. It holds it, you'll have holdings of US dollars. Um, it'll be denominated, sorry, in US dollars, denominated in, in the pound, uh, those type of things. But, you know, when the US dollar exchange rate changes relative to the pound or relative to the euro, then our reserves are affected. Yeah. So by holding another currency, it sort of provides us um, an opportunity to diversify yeah. our holdings of um, a foreign exchange reserve so that we're no longer holding just U.S. dollars and therefore subject to the volatility in the bilateral exchange rates. We now have another currency that we can hedge against that volatility. So that's the first thing, the diversification benefit that can come about from holding Bitcoin. And over the long period that we looked at in this study, relatively long period that we looked at in this study, it, the, the level of volatility that we saw in, in Bitcoin wasn't that different from what we observe in other uh, currencies. So it, it does seem to have some potential benefit there and we crunched the numbers in the paper and we reported the results. The other thing, the other benefit that we can also mention that can come about as well, and this one is, is an area that has not occurred as yet, but it is something that we mentioned in the paper, and that's this is the idea of a, of a speculative attack. Yeah. Uh, so, one of the reasons for holding um, your reserves is that you want to defend your exchange rate peg, so that we can always say that whenever you're ready, you can come to the central bank and exchange your two Barbados dollars for one US dollar. Um, Holding reserves in, in Bitcoin allows us another um, angle to say protect against such an attack because someone can say, for example, um, through their Bitcoin wallet, they could bet against the um, devaluation of the Barbados dollar. There's no way for the central bank of Barbados to um, protect against that at the moment because they don't hold any Bitcoin. 
So usually one way you can protect against uh, attack on your currency is to basically hold that other currency. So if someone wants to attack the Barbados dollar using US dollars, they would uh, we need to have enough US dollars to defend against that attack. So therefore what we're proposing here is that we have enough Bitcoin to defend against such an attack uh, against the Barbados dollar. Now that is something looking very far into the future because that isn't anything that is really, um, sorry, I just want to mention this as soon as I say that because there's not anything that is um, even very re a remote possibility. It is a very, it's not a very major issue to look at um, as yet. Uh, because you first, we have foreign exchange controls in Barbados, so you first have to be able to um, purchase Barbados dollars in order to do that, and you would need to get those Barbados dollars then converted into Bitcoin, and with our foreign exchange controls, that is going to be a very difficult thing to do in any significant way. So the possibility of a speculative attack against the Barbados dollar is something that is a very, it's not even a significant possibility at the moment using Bitcoin, but it's something that we sort of mentioned that could become an issue uh, in the future. Actually, it, it, is, it is even more of an issue now because of the colored, the colored um, coin protocol. And it depends on like people like Bit. This bit we did not mention in the paper, but this became very relevant to me after I found out how Bit for instance, as a company, was transferring or being able to convert Barbadian dollars into Bitcoin? Let's just do, uh, just very briefly, can you talk, uh, give a few sentences about what PIT is and, and what they're doing and how that yeah. relates here? All right, yeah, so it's the first Caribbean, well, the first digital asset exchange in the Caribbean. Uh, I think they're way more than a crypto currency exchange so it's a digital asset exchange founded here in Barbados by two Barbadian entrepreneurs Gabriel Abed who seems to be rather popular in the Bitcoin community and his finance guy Oliver Gill so I'm also as a matter of disclosure a consultant to Bit and very early in their life they would have been consulting me on different regulatory issues and also looking at economic impact in fact the same color coins protocol they chose came about because of questions I asked them as to how they would plan to convert. Now, the good thing about Bit at its current size is that it's not large enough a, uh, let's say a broker, if I can call it that, or an exchange, I should say, to have the a large amount of convertible Barbados dollars into Bitcoin and Bitcoin into US. Mm -hmm. They're not going to have as much as the central bank can. So in that respect, the central bank isn't under any immediate speculative threats. But for argument's sake, if BIT becomes, let's say, if BIT is able to hold in their reserves or in their buffer 10 billion US, which I don't think will happen that quickly, but for argument's sake, if they're able to convert up to 10 billion US at on demand in Barbadian dollars, then somebody through BIT could actually become a threat. What that calls for then is that, and a bit, I, I'm glad they've been very open. They have KYC, they have an infrastructure that allows regulators, if they ever wish to, to be able to look into Jeremy the define Jeremy, define KYC. Sorry, know your, know your customer. An anti money laundering term, knowing your customer. So it's very open. And what that has done, at least, and Gabriel could easily defend it, is that it allows any regulator, if they are feeling a possible threat, to be able to supervise, not necessarily supervise, sorry, to see what BIT is doing. But as it stands, Vincent is correct. In the near term, there could be no speculative attacks on the currency. In the future, it would be the central banks, and this is the reason why we motivated, we were motivated to write this paper. In the future, central banks across the Caribbean would have to become even more aware that these things can be possible because money as in terms of velocity, it would be flowing a lot more freely across the Caribbean and from a global market where you guys are down here without any friction, without anybody slowing it down. Once it can be matched, once they can find enough Barbadian dollars to match your order, if you're sending money here, they would do it. Cool. Those are, those are very, very interesting scenarios. Like, you know, uh, perhaps in my mind, it's like Bitcoin is too small to... Today, you know, uh, you know, 
launching speculative attacks off bitcoin might be difficult but yeah maybe one day when it's big uh, i think uh, these kinds of scenarios could definitely occur oh uh, not not just bitcoin maher remember it's any cryptocurrency these guys are just um these exchanges are built into several blockchains so the problem is the cumulative effect of all currencies the paper focused on bitcoin and yes again winston is correct that no it wouldn't be if there's 21 million units to be produced in the near term there's no way that bitcoin would be a threat but i'm talking about all cryptocurrencies i'm talking about ethereum i'm talking about litecoin dogecoin bitcoin all of them combined eventually can be an issue for small countries like barbados can be so if I, not i and it is an issue that was also mentioned in other papers as well. There's actually a paper that, that we referenced in our study that suggests that the IMF, plus International Aris. Monetary Fund, yeah, plus should Aris. actually consider holding some type of cryptocurrency in their reserves as well. So it's an issue that has been discussed in the, in the academic literature as well. Right. But so just a little bit more on this. I, I don't understand what exactly you mean here. So how would this speculative attack using cryptocurrency or blockchain backed assets or something how, how would that practically work okay so winston mentioned before that we have we have foreign exchange controls the way a foreign exchange control works because it is not is not widely practiced globally greece to a lesser extent and yeah greece is probably the most prominent example of what current foreign currency controls are but essentially your central bank or your government says you can only get this amount of us dollars right now so okay let's look at it this way imagine i am somehow upset with my economic situation locally i don't like how things are going i could if i'm a multi-millionaire decide i will go to my commercial bank i will like all of my money sent out in US dollars. Therefore, the demand for US dollars, if I'm a multimillionaire in a small country like Barbados, it would be significant. So uh, the demand for US dollars increases, making, in a sense, the value of the Barbadian dollar less. So in a sense. So I have launched, essentially, if allowed, a speculative, uh, an attack on my own currency. Now, I'm not doing it for gain. But remember, if it were that I wanted to buy Barbadian dollars cheap and, and, and sell them and sell US dollars expensively for a profit, I could do the same thing, except the intention would be different. So what I do, I go and if I get permission, money sent overseas. The central bank is always aware of how much US is in legal circulation. So therefore, they could easily step in and say, Jeremy, you're rich, but you're too rich. You can't send all of that money overseas right now we only allow you X. Or, depending on your reason, you will not be allowed to send this money overseas. Now, mm. imagine Bitcoin and it's unregulated. My God. What I know could do is I can go to companies like Bit or any other digital registry, digital asset exchange, sorry, that sets up here in the Caribbean or in Barbados and says, and I say, I go up to these guys, hey, I've got X amount of Barbados dollars on me right now. I can write you a check for $10 million, which I can do legally, dear. And once it moves, the 10 million moves from one Barbadian hand to another Barbadian hand, the central bank is never involved. So unless it is, it comes down to some kind of anti-money laundering thing. What I then could do is I go to Bit, I give 10 million US, Bit can send that money um, via Bitcoin overseas and in their overseas accounts. 10 million, well, 5 million US, 10 million Barbadian here. So 5 million US then is uh, outside of the country. What that then does, if the market, if the market, if the banks become aware of that transaction, it in effect puts pressure on the Barbadian dollar. In other words, the demand for Barbadian dollars fall and they rise. No, it can happen. The U.S. dollar rises in value. So it can happen from another way around where somebody decides through Bitcoin, they're using the same asset exchanges to purchase a lot of U.S. dollars and sell these US dollars through the exchange and get a lot of Barbadian dollars. Or they can then wait for some time, sell Barbadian dollars very quickly and end up purchasing a lot of US dollars off of the exchange 
very quickly as well. It causes the value to become unstable and the central bank therefore cannot defend it because at no time is the central bank's resources nor our commercial bank resources locally drawn upon. But the Barbadian dollar is being manipulated in value um, versus anywhere else. So then it could be the case where too that for argument's sake our commercial banks decide to go through if it's unregulated they can decide to go through bit if they want to get access to easy US dollars overseas and therefore then it becomes much more difficult for the central bank to defend the currency whilst they aren't able to give permission for that current floor for US dollars to be in circulation yeah 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 perhaps I, I could I could I could describe this a bit differently okay so um, so so the so the so basically the, the interesting scenario is when um, you have companies like bit or maybe the future ones that start to issue Barbadian, Barbadian dollars on the blockchain and the blockchain itself is and and you have you know some kind of exchanges running on the blockchain itself like it becomes very easy to ex exchange Barbadian dollars for Bitcoin and the other way around and and maybe in, even in the future it becomes easy to short sell Barbadian dollars just using the Bitcoin blockchain so for our listeners that 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 haven't heard of short selling it's basically I, I borrow some asset like a Barbadian dollar and I sell it on the market and I and the person from whom I borrowed I promise to repay Barbadian dollars let's say three months down the line now, now maybe like short selling the Barbadian dollar on the Bitcoin blockchain might be a possibility that opens up, you know, in, in two or three years if, if with the colored coin protocol, etc. And basically then what happens is all of the international speculators, maybe for the first time get the ability to short sell huge amounts of Barbadian dollars. This ability they don't have today because, uh, because of the way the central banks can control the flows of money inside Barbados but on the Bitcoin blockchain they really can't and therefore if a lot of them like engage in short selling Barbadian dollars on the Bitcoin blockchain then that in effect be becomes a speculative attack against the currency of Barbados right that, that is a very good explanation yeah it's basically the same thing yeah yeah uh, and and just uh, one more thing right the reason why this is a threat is because uh, Barbados doesn't hold, you know, doesn't have full reserves, right? So it, if everybody who has Barbadian dollars comes to you, uh, comes to central bank and says, "I want my U.S. dollars for that," then uh, Barbados is going to run out of U.S. dollars, right? Yeah, but um, as we just said, there there are exchange controls in place and. So the, if you want to take your, um, if you want to convert your Barbados dollars into US dollars, you have to, you know, have a reason why you want to do that. Um, so maybe you would want to purchase goods overseas. And usually there are no, once you're doing current account transactions, so you're purchasing goods or services, it's a relatively easy process to convert Barbados dollars into US dollars. Yeah. Um, capital transactions, because of the risk there, say for example, if people want to speculate in terms of land uh, acquisitions and so on, then you need to provide some good justification for why you want to convert such a large amount of money into US dollars. Um, and then there really isn't a need to hold so much reserves. So um, it, is very unlikely that uh, every single Barbadian is going to come to the central bank asking to convert um, Barbados dollars into US dollars because this is one of the sort of behavioral aspects of economics now. If you were to come to Barbados um, right now and Barbados is in the midst of, or we're trying to come out of a recession, if you were to come to Barbados and offer a Barbadian, um, say, less than the two to one exchange rate, or if you, you want to sell your one US dollar for three to one, um, Barbadians will not accept that. They will say three to one. I can get two to one. Two to one is the rate. So there is uh, this fundamental belief in Barbados in relation to the exchange rate peg. So once you have that, that you know, you've sort of heard the idea of a self-fulfilling um, prophecy. Um, that doesn't exist in Barbados in relation to the exchange rate. Barbadians all believe that the exchange rate should be two to one. And 
they would not exchange, ac accept any other rate except to the one. So it, it, that sort of scenario is, is really unlikely. Even in relation to the, um, the banking system as well, um, so the the commercial, but sorry, the government has been issuing lots of debt over the last couple of years, and there still is a, a significant demand for Barbados dollar denominated debt by commercial banks in Barbados because the the belief in the Barbados exchange rate and the belief in the Barbados economy. So that sort of scenario is not a possibility. The only reason we raise it in the paper as a sort of like an academic interest it is an issue that is maybe sometime in the future. And as academics, we want to discuss it and flag it as being a potential issue. Today's magic word is Barbados. That's B A R B A D O S. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So, could you summarize the major advantages and disadvantages for the central bank of holding Bitcoin? One of the major advantages, again, would be that they could become. In terms of the academic thing Winston was talking about just now, they could become a bit more able to defend the value of the currency if there's a speculative attack in our future. That's the first advantage. The other one is that they actually reduce the volatility of their portfolio of currencies that are currently held. So it's just like any of our portfolios, any of us that invest in stock, any of us that invest in currencies, if you invest in an asset, that actually has proven to be less volatile than the average set of currencies that you currently do hold, then yes, your returns might not be as big overall in the future, but you reduce the high likelihood that you will have losses. Uh, the next one, allow, it helps in terms of the central bank being able to perform better monetary policy. So because of the whole idea that you can, you can use the metadata on the blockchain to verify transactions, it allows the central bank as well, if, if a Barbadian decides to want a lot of US dollars, the central bank would know without even using a lot of human resources in the near future. They can almost approve a transaction instantaneously. Likewise, our commercial banking sector should be able to do the same. Our government, as I said earlier, should be able to do the same for smart contracts. Those are the three biggest advantages for me as far as I'm concerned. Winston? No, right. So I agree with that as well, because the one of the key ones that we mentioned was in relation to diversification. Um, and if you are just concentrated in, say, U.S. dollar denominated assets, then you sort of subject yourself to the volatility in terms of the changes in the U.S. dollar bilateral exchange rate. So holding another currency um allows us to diversify our holdings of international um, reserves. There, there is still a, a nice small discussion that we had in the paper as well of whether or not you would consider Bitcoin an asset uh, and is, is, fund, is a fundamental discussion because um, right now when we hold international reserves, we hold um, US dollar securities. Uh, which is which is an asset that is internationally accepted and can easily be converted, um, but there there is still a little bit of debate of whether or not the Bitcoin is an asset or simply just um, uh, a method for uh, allowing transactions to take place. And in terms of dis disadvantages, yeah. So in terms of disadvantages, a lot of it has to do with what the readiness of a of a monetary authority or monetary authorities globally to want to get into the system. So that's the first one. That it, if it isn't a regulator, then it becomes much more harder for a small open economies monetary authority, i.e., the central bank to actually defend said currency if there is, again, a speculative attack. I would say in terms of holding the currency now, the costs, I, I, and we had mentioned in the paper, if you remember, Winston, the whole notion that a central bank could consider itself to be a miner if, it be, if it's competitively priced to be a miner. And all of us know right now it will be too late in the game for the central bank to mine Bitcoin per se, but not necessarily Ethereum, if the, if the case may be. So if it is that it's competitive, competitive to uh, mine 
a cryptocurrency, a central bank should consider doing so instead of having to buy off the world market because it might be cheaper to produce than to purchase, especially if there's some kind of speculative run against major currencies such as the central bank, sorry, such as the US dollar or the euro or the pound or the yen. So a major disadvantage would be if they are holding and mining that they might not be doing so competitively and paying way more for the right to hold a cryptocurrency for the purpose of defending the currency or for the purpose of allowing transactions seamlessly to pass through Barbados. Yes, the other issue that we mentioned in the paper was the whole uh, volatility. Uh, you know, one of the things with volatility is once there's enough liquidity, uh, volatility is not an issue. But if you are simply buying an, as um, an asset and holding it for a fairly long period of time, then you then subject yourself to that um, type of volatility. And we, we sort of looked at that issue of volatility in the paper, and we mentioned that it could become an a, a, a issue uh, for a central bank. So that's one of the issues that we'd also need to consider if you're going to hold uh, Bitcoin as part of the international reserves. And that's why it's very important, the, the finding from the paper that the central bank should consider holding an insignificant portion to help balance out its portfolio, you know, less than 1%, 1%, but not 10% for certain because then you really subject uh, the value of your international reserves to too much volatility and too much uncertainty. And therefore, it hinders your mandate to defend our currency and then it begins to send a signal, a behavioral signal to Barbadians that the central bank might not be able to defend said currency. And then the average Barbadian walks around thinking, oh my, we grew up hearing $2 Barbados to one US. It might no longer be so and you can have panic if need be or you can have just general uncertainty and apathy. It would happen. I mean, for all of my life, 32 years, I, I was led to believe this thing was two to one. But if I did not study economics, I wouldn't know that it is subjective and it has a lot to do with what a central bank wishes to do. Again, to ensure that it's the last, a lender of last resort and therefore protector of the value of our currency. So what's the, what's the status there? Do you guys see any chance of this happening in Barbados or in maybe in some other central banks uh, across the world? When are we going to see the first central bank run Ethereum mining farm? <laughs> All right, well, I wouldn't be a good economist or finance guy <laughs> if I wanted to predict a bank, a central bank run or speculative attack. I, I would, however, try to encourage central banks to ensure that they are educated enough about these protocols to ensure that they can protect themselves from such speculative runs. Now, let me say this. The paper itself, and I don't know if Winston remembers this because I made mention, the paper itself would have drawn the interest of the Central Bank of Canada, the Bank of Canada. And I know that as part of their own research, they've been looking at the paper and looking at what our findings were with respect to our small open economies. Because I was knowledgeable for some time that the Bitcoin community has been making arguments that regulators should really see the value in a decentralized format, uh, a de sorry, a decentralized and a progressively frictionless format, yeah, or format of currency. So I know some central banks are progressively looking at it, but I don't know which central bank will be the first to declare we are going to hold as a portion of our currency, um, sorry, our reserves, some digital currency. I think, however, as the paper would have shown we, when we did some literature reviews that the, there are certain commercial banks that began to see the viability of creating their own digital currencies and cryptocurrencies because of the frictionless or relatively frictionless nature of said um, formats. So a central bank would eventually follow when they realize that it becomes a lot more difficult to defend and protect the value of their own currencies simply because the commercial banks have been able to circumvent um, circumvent them and, and become a threat to their ability to defend said currency.
Yeah, and remember the central bank in most countries is the government's uh, bank. So once the uh, once governments around the world start um, utilizing Bitcoin a bit more in terms of their transactions, and Jeremy mentioned a number of potential areas that they can um, do this in terms of land registry. But say for example, every single month the government makes a transfer from its accounts to um, its employees' accounts. Uh, imagine if all of that was done using Bitcoin, the government would save on um, bank fees. And then also you have a large number of individuals then that all would also um, have Bitcoin that they can use for expenditure purposes. And if that ever becomes the case, then it then would make the case for the central bank um, getting involved in Bitcoin a lot stronger because its main customer, which is the government, is then involved in um in the Bitcoin or cryptocurrency uh, market. So government would also play a fairly important role in, in identifying whether or not the central banks around the world would move uh, in that direction. And I'm very much encouraging even more yoga developers out there to create more cryptocurrencies because then it lessens the volatility of one cryptocurrency if you can get a wide basket of all. And the whole point is that the central bank or a central bank would only, only go in if holding that said currency is not highly going to affect the volatility of its portfolio. So the more cryptocurrencies that come to market, less power that a particular miner has over the value of all cryptocurrencies. And therefore, I think then that would be the time that this paper and other research that will follow would have or hold a bit more weight with central bankers. But I would say one other advantage I did not mention. We all know about the SWIFT protocol that banks use to move funds from one bank account held at a particular bank to another one. Yeah. Okay, well, we're at the end of our episode. So thanks so much for, for coming on, guys. It's, it's really exciting that you guys are definitely thinking a little bit beyond what probably most central bankers are thinking about and writing about it. And it's also exciting that, you know, there's technology startups now in Barbados, you know, pursuing visions like, you know, like Bit with, with this colored coin, uh, color coin approach. So I'm, I'm, I'm for one part uh, very excited to see what's going to come out of these efforts. Uh, both on the on the practical side, but also when it comes to your own research efforts and, and where they will go next. Um, and yeah, so thanks so much uh, for coming on. Of course, we'll we'll link to. Thanks for inviting us on as well. Yeah, of course we'll we'll link to to your paper uh, and you. also to um, to it, let us know if there's some other places you want us to link to maybe your university pages where people can find uh, new papers you publish on this topic so yeah thanks so much guys thank you thanks for listen listeners uh, for listening as every week so we're part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network you can find lots of great shows on letstalkbitcoin.com about different topics and um, yeah, if you want to listen to the show, you can do so using any podcast app out there or you can watch videos too on youtube.com slash epicenter BTC. And if, you're, if you want to, you can also leave us an iTunes review or a review on some other uh, service. And if you do that, just send us an email uh, at show at epicenter bitcoin.com and we will send you a t-shirt. We send out perhaps 50 at this point all over to all over the world so if you want one then just do the same and let us know so thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week Bye.